sense the presence of the Lord here this morning? Listen, I knew, I knew this morning was going to be special. Because the last few days, especially on two occasions, I was in my house praying about this service. And God's presence was so powerful, it's like the walls shook and the earth moved. For a Chicago boy, you know, there's a slogan they have as to how to protect yourself during earthquakes, and I didn't quite know the slogan. My wife says, are we supposed to be doing something? And I couldn't think of it. I go, shake, rattle, and roll. Shake, rattle, and roll. She goes, I don't think that's it. Listen, all joking aside, the hour and 15 minutes we spend here on a Sunday morning is different than any other hour and 15 minutes you spend throughout your week. Because when our faith comes together, we can have an expectation that God will do not just the routine and the normal, but he'll do something supernatural and divine in our life. When we worship God the way you were worshiping God, the Bible says it's in the middle of that worship he becomes really present. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to open his word and we're going to study and learn about two battles that you and I are facing. We're going to understand what they are and what the Bible teaches about how we overcome in these battles. And then at the end of opening his word, we're going to take communion, but it's not going to be normal. We're going to expect God in his divine presence to do one of two miracles for us in here. Because overcoming that battle, we can't do it out of our emotion or our intellect. We need the spirit of God to do something in our heart and soul, but we're going to believe that he's going to do that because he is present. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you that you welcomed us into this place, that you inhabit our praise, and we lift our expectation, our faith, that through your word and through communion, you are going to be so good to bless us with victory and deliverance in these battles that we face, Lord Jesus. We thank you in advance of what you're going to do over these next few minutes as you are present with us. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So last week, I was in the Philippines, and I was meeting with a group of young pastors and leaders that I had never met before. So as I'm flying into Manila, I'm thinking to myself, how do I relate to them? How do I connect with them? You know, should I be a pastor role? Should I be a teacher role? Should, should I be like an uncle? They're very family oriented. How do I relate to them? How do I connect to them? This is a question we oftentimes ask. How do I relate to my neighbors? How do I relate to my coworkers? And then we ask it about God. How should I relate to God? How can I connect to God? And in that we face oftentimes two battles that if we're not careful, our mind, our heart and soul misinterprets and misunderstands how do I relate to God, how do I connect to God, and we're going to look at a passage of scripture that's actually two stories combined. Jesus tells this parable, and in the parable he talks about a Pharisee and a tax collector, the battle of grace that you and I face in our heart and soul. But while he's telling that parable, some people try to bring their kids to Jesus, and the disciples Taking on a power they're not supposed to have, say, no, 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 no. We'll decide what can happen here. You can't do that. The battle of faith, trusting his way. Open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 18. And let's read these two incidences and let the Lord do a miracle in our hearts. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9. To some who are confident of their own righteousness... Look down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place on his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me. and Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Here's this first battle we face. The Pharisee, who is highly religious, performing for God, or the tax collector, who is desperately needing and can't do anything about his situation. First, we got to understand the Pharisee because of the contrast. There were about six or 7,000 Pharisees in the time of Christ. They were responding to Roman rule the way other Jewish people would respond. Israel was living under this oppressive government of Rome. So there were some people who said, let's revolt, let's take up arms and let's kill every Roman. They were called zealots in the New Testament. Then there were other people who said, no, 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 let's negotiate. Let's be involved in the process, let's make peace and let's compromise, but we'll negotiate. They were called Sadducees. But then there was a group of people who said, it doesn't matter what the Roman government does. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. All that matters is that we are loyal to God's law, that we follow God's law. They were devoutly religious. They were called the Pharisees. If a Pharisee walked in this church this morning in normal clothes, we would look at him or her and we would say, wow, that's an amazing Christian. I wish I could be a Christian like that, because the Bible describes them. They didn't just pray. They prayed multiple times a day. They were devout in their religious devotion. They tithed to the finite degree. Even their gardens, they would make sure that they would tithe their vegetables. They would never be late for church. They were really devout in their commitment to God. It says that they would cross the seas just to win one convert. I barely walk across my street to talk to my neighbor. They would go across the ocean. We would look at that individual and say, wow, I wish I was a Christian like that. And yet Jesus says this. He says, you're a brood of snakes. Now he's not just name calling, but he's giving a reference to them like he did to Peter when he said, get thee behind me, Satan. He says, if you are in this battle and you start taking on the mindset of a Pharisee, I've got to perform for God. What matters is my religious devotion. You will find yourself under the very wrong influence, and you will never walk in this victory. Look at what the Pharisee says. He says, God, I fast. I tithe. Because for people who have found themselves in this battle, it's my religious performance that gives me access to God. And even those of us who are saved, sometimes we find that thought seeping in. How do I make sure God knows? What do I need to do? And we find our religious behavior is what will give me in contact with God, will make God do things. Every religion is the same this way. Every religion, although its external expression is different, has this one thought. Here's what you do, and that will give you access to God. So Islam has these five pillars. These pillars will give you access to God. Buddhism has eight pathways. These pathways will give you access to God. Judaism has the Ten Commandments. These Ten Commandments will give you access to God. Every religion says, here's what you need to do so you can have access to God. Here's how you prove yourself or show yourself. Now, you've heard me say this before. Jesus, the Son of God, did not come to earth to start another religion. He came to destroy religion, to end it, because we cannot have access to God. God has access to us. He comes down here. His son comes and dies on the cross and resurrects. So now we can have a relationship with God, but there's this battle that goes on. And what happens is we become like the Pharisee. Well, when we're thinking, how do I prove myself to God? The way we begin to do that is by comparing. I mean, Pharisees going, I'm not like the robbers or the evildoers. We're always finding somebody who's not quite as good as we are. I'm not like this evil tax collector whatsoever. And we're in this battle where sometimes we find ourselves thinking we have to perform or prove to God our devoutness. And that will convince him to work. And you say, no, 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 Joel, that's not me. I would never do that. All right, so let me give you a little quiz. 
The Bible talks about this thing called temptation. It's not sin. It's when you are faced with an option. It can draw you closer to God, but it can definitely move you away from God. Do you share your temptations with people? Because if we have a tendency to keep them quiet, what we're doing is saying, if I talk to people about what I'm tempted with, it doesn't make me look very good. We think it's sin. We label it such so we don't share our temptations. I think it's an amazing that Jesus was tempted just like we are. And he said, I'm not going to hide it. I'm actually going to put it in the book so that the world knows I was tempted. But when we don't share the temptations we face that could move us away from God, it may be an indicator there's part of me in this battle that's tempted to want to perform and prove myself for God. Here's the good news. World's best known Pharisee was a guy named Saul. He was devoutly religious, but then he met Jesus and he discovered in this battle this thing called grace. And he wrote most of the New Testament. And in writing the New Testament, he talks about a freedom because of the bondage and the burden of trying to perform for God. He talks about this freedom and this joy and his single pursuit of passionately pursuing Jesus. And Paul would say this, you want to know my story? My story's in the tax collector. Because there's this contrast. Are you religiously devout? No. Be like this tax collector. Now, tax collectors were the most evil, hated people because they were in connection with the Roman government to steal and to rob and to cheat elderly Jewish people, even though they were Jewish themselves. So they were considered the worst of sinners. Listen to the words of this tax collector. He says, have mercy on me, Lord. I'm a sinner. He is clearly aware that there is a gap between him and God. Jesus says, this is where you got to start. We're in this battle. You're not religiously devout. You're not proving yourself to be godlike. No, you start by this clear awareness that there is a gap between me and God. Sometimes I get a bit concerned as a pastor that salvation becomes kind of cheap, kind of trivial. It's like there's such an abundance of it, and the Bible teaches it's free, and it's an abundant, which makes it kind of cheap. It's like water on a faucet. You're never really grateful because you just turn it on, turn it off, it's always there. I mean, let's be honest. For many of us in here, here's kind of our salvation story. We tried everything else, and when nothing else worked to try to find meaning and purpose in life, then we came to Jesus. We tried careers, we tried money, some of us even tried addictions, relationships, and when none of that worked, then we came to Jesus. It's not like we're giving him the best compliment in the world here. It's like, I tried everything else, and then when none of it worked, okay, I'll come to Jesus. Imagine me in school, and there's a girl, and she dates every guy in the class, and none of them really are up to her standards. So then she comes to me, and she says, okay, Joel, I guess I'll date you. <laughs> this is the amazing thing about God's grace. Even when we tried everything else and came to him last, he still stoops down to receive us as if we came to him first. He still loves us. This is the amazing grace that we have to discover. This tax collector, he won't even look up to heaven. Do you know why? He has what the Bible calls a fear of God. Now, I've got to be careful in talking about this because we live in a society that refuses to say that fear and love can be joined together at any time. I mean, the Bible teaches in the New Testament, perfect love drives out fear. But the fear that John is talking about is a terrifying, evil fear. Throughout the Bible, it talks about this holy, righteous, healthy fear. And we kind of explain that by using words like a reverence or an awe. And those words are accurate, but they're not enough. This tax collector knows, I am not God. I was created. I do not have not a beginning. I am not holy. There's all kinds of junk inside of me. And I can't fix myself. And he has this understanding of a fear of God. The best illustration I can give 
is my dad. There, there are no perfect fathers, but my dad came pretty close. From a very, very, very immediate young age, I knew my dad loved me unconditionally. I trusted him with every aspect of my life. But I had a fear of my father, a healthy fear, because he had directives that were best for my life. And I knew if I step outside of those directives, my dad loves me so much, he won't just let it slide. He'll correct me on it. He will give me discipline on it. This is the kind of fear that we begin with, that the tax collector had. I am not God. There is a separation. There's a great verse in Psalms 25 that illustrates why it's so important to understand this fear of God idea if we're going to be victorious in this battle we have. Look at the screens. Here's this Psalm 25 verse. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. He makes known his covenant to them. You see, when the gap between me and God is very small, then grace is very small. But when the gap between me and God is very big, like this tax collector, then grace becomes incredibly big. And Jesus says, listen, it was this tax collector, not the Pharisee, who was justified. And what he's explaining there is God didn't fix the tax collector. He doesn't fix you. He makes you brand new. He recreates you, and you are now brand new. And then all of that shame and all of that separation is gone. Because in this story, there's one little statement Jesus makes that you can't miss. And if you miss it, you will lose this battle of grace. It says the tax collector went home. You do not stay in the temple in shame, holding your head down, saying, God, what a sinner I am. Because when you encounter the grace of Jesus Christ, you are made new, and then you go on. You lift your head. Now you have a faith. Now you have a victory. Now that big gap that had the fear of God is shut close, and now I am a co-heir with Christ. The tax collector actually went home. And some of you here are like this tax collector, but you haven't left that position. Amen. You're still, oh, what a sinner I am. And when you do that, you slip into becoming like the Pharisee. I got to prove myself. I got to perform. Jesus says, no, 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 don't do this. Don't lose this battle. Know that it is my grace, this ridiculous free gift that we can barely wrap our minds around that is so real and so pure that completely eliminates that and we are justified and I don't stay there. I leave. I no longer walk in shame. I no longer walk in guilt and even when I stumble, I no longer walk with a sense of any kind of a gap. That's the power of grace. You can't intellectually get there. You can't emotionally get there. But when we take communion, God, by his goodness through Christ and the Holy Spirit, will get you there. Amen. And you will walk in a freedom. Then this second battle takes place. Because while this story's going on, Jesus wants them to understand that when I leave that temple and I'm full of this victory and power and glory, now I find myself in a second battle. And that battle is between being like the disciples who put themselves in a position of control or like a child who puts himself or herself in a position of trust. So you've got to understand this contrast. Here's the disciples. Now, you have to understand in the ancient world, these disciples, they were of the lowest status. They were fishermen. They weren't the elite. They weren't the educated. In that culture, a rabbi would not go pick disciples. But young men would go to the rabbis and ask to become a disciple. And it was a very special honor. And the, the rabbi would say, yes, you can come and join me. Every young man probably would try to do that. These young men, no. They're not qualified. They're not good enough. And then comes along this rabbi named Jesus. And he's unlike any other rabbi. When he teaches, people listen. Thousands and thousands are following him. He has a power. There is something special about this guy. And he goes to these disciples who society has rejected, who religious leaders look down upon, and he goes to them, he says, I choose you. And all of a sudden now, they are special. They get chosen like Jesus chooses us. Amen. But something happens in them. It says throughout the Gospels that they begin to think of themselves 
I'm now in control. I now have a power. They begin to have arguments over who's going to be greatest. They send their mom to lobby for their position. They ask Jesus, hey, when you establish your kingdom, do I get a seat on the cabinet? They put themselves in a place of power and control. And it's illustrated because when parents start to bring their little kids for Jesus to bless, the disciples take this position of authority. We will decide what this Christianity is going to look like. And it's an illustration of us at times. I'll decide what areas of my life I trust with Jesus, but then I'll decide what areas of my life that I will control myself. The disciples rebuked these people, and there is this battle. Do I get to control my life, or do I trust my life to Jesus? Every aspect of my life. I know I've got his grace, I'm saved, but is he really my Lord in every way? And here's what we do. If we're honest, when we're in this battle, we create in our minds an image of Jesus who looks just like us so that we're okay. So if I'm a Republican, Jesus would have been a Republican. If I'm a Democrat, Jesus would have been a Democrat. If I have these certain values, Jesus has these values. If I manage my money this certain way, Jesus would have managed his money the way I'm managing my money. And I'm all good. Listen, a Jesus that you create in your image can't help you. He can't challenge you. He cannot come against some areas of your life that need transformation so you can grow into the amazing, beautiful child of God that he wants you to be. And there's this battle, if we're honest. Do I completely trust him with every aspect of my life? Or do I keep control over some areas? Now, I know you guys are thinking, wow, Joel, that's kind of harsh. I would never be that way. All right, let me give you another quiz. <laughs> be honest with yourself about this quiz. Do you trust him? Or are you in control? We talk about faith a lot, trusting God. When you talk about faith, when you ask people to pray, when you raise a scenario in your life and you say, I'm trusting God, is almost all the time you talk about faith and trusting God around a problem so that your faith really is only problem-centered. If I need a job, problem, I'm trusting God. If I'm sick, problem, I'm trusting God. So when it comes to other areas of your life that are not a problem, you don't really talk about faith. You don't really talk about trust. It's just problem-centered. Now, Jesus is here to answer your problems. But if your faith is predominantly defined by just a problem, you may be in this battle and you don't even know it. Because what you're saying is, I will rely on him for his power, but not for his wisdom or authority. And you will stay limited in all that he wants to do in and through you. There is a burden that is on your shoulders that you know when you're trying to make life work. And Jesus is really clear and he says, listen, guys, you've got this battle. You can choose. I'm going to be like a disciple. I'll control what my Christianity looks like. He says, no, no, you've got to be like a child. When you're like a child, then all of the kingdom is fully available for you. And you may be sitting here this morning going, I wish I had more of God. I read about the promises of the Bible. I know what the description of the kingdom is. How do I relate to? How do I make contact? How do I access this? And Jesus, in this story, makes it really clear. you got to become like a child. you got to trust like a child. And he gives three little clues for us in what he teaches. He says, the kingdom is received. You can't acquire it. Children can't get stuff. They don't have the capacity. A four-year-old can't go out and get a job and buy their own apartment and rent. they got to receive. He says, then little children, there's something in how he describes their age. And then he says, it belongs to them. They actually have ownership. And it gives us an insight into what does it mean to trust Jesus and not control any area of my life. First of all, he says, the kingdom is received. Kids are completely dependent. They don't have any self-sufficiency to them. I got a, like an 18-month-old grandson, and we're all sitting around the living room, right? 
And we, I didn't know it, none of us knew it, but my grandson needed his diaper changed. And there's like seven of us adults. He comes and picks me. <laughs> he walks over and he grabs my finger and he leads me away. I said, oh, I'm special. We're gonna go play somewhere. He picked me over the rest of you. And he walks me into his bedroom and he grabs a diaper. And all of a sudden, I know now what's going on here. And he literally lays down on the floor, hands me the diaper, and spread eagle. And I'm going, what's up with this? But I thought, this is a picture of what Jesus is talking about. Jesus, I can't take care of myself. I need your help here. This is what it means to trust him, where you put yourself in a place of dependency. Now, I came across some notes actually written by children to God that kind of illustrate the spirit we need to have that we can walk in into the fullness of the kingdom. Take a look at the screens. Here are some notes the kids actually wrote. How did you know you were God? I think that's such an honest question. Dear God, who draws the lines around the countries? I would like to know why all the things you said are in red. Here's another note. Dear God, when you made the first man, did he work as good as we do now? Dear God, my grandpa says you were around when he was a little boy. How far back do you go? <laughs> we read Thomas Edison made light. But in Sunday school, they said you did it. I bet he stole your idea. <laughs> Dear God, it is great the way you always get the stars in the right places. Dear God, I could not think anybody could be a better God. Well, I just want you to know, but I'm not saying that because you're God. <laughs> Dear God. I don't ever feel alone since I found out about you. Jesus says, when you find yourself in this place of dependency, and little children have this incredible dependency because it's not just about their stuff. It's not about this need or that need. It's about their complete identity. Many of you know that our, two of our kids are adopted. And when Lisa came to us at six months from China, and if you came to her as a nine-year-old and said, are you sure you're a part of that family? She wouldn't even understand the question. It would make no sense to her. Because not only are there legal documents that said she was legally adopted, as a dad and as a mom, we fully embraced her. She had sisters, brothers and sisters in the family. She participated in the family. And there's such an identity that she had in the family that if you said, are you sure you're part of the family because you're adopted? She wouldn't even get it. Jesus says, when you get to that place of dependency, then the kingdom is fully available to you. And some of you in here are fighting this battle because you want to be independent. I will control some areas. And you got to know, you will never get to God's best until you become like a child who's fully dependent. Then he says the second thing. He says, little children. In the first century, in the time of Jesus, little kids were considered pure and innocent until they came to a place of what was called the age of accountability. They were not held accountable for their behavior. They were just always seen as pure and innocent. So when he uses this phrase, little children, he's referring to this identity. Trusting God is realizing that you're like a little kid who is pure and innocent because of the grace that he has given to you. Put it another way, you have not engaged in image control like the Pharisee. You are not wondering what other people are thinking about you because you're pure and innocent. When I was four years old, maybe five years old, we came back to uh, the States. My parents were missionaries in South Korea and it was my first time back and my dad and mom and us as kids went from church to church that supported him as a missionary, and we, he spoke at churches, and so we were kids, and we kind of tagged along. So my parents prepared us. We were not Baptist or Presbyterian. We were part of a church called Pentecostals. So my dad taught us, because in a church, somebody may come up to you, and they may ask you this question, you know, what kind of a Christian are you? So you answer, we're Pentecostals. So we come to the States. We're here for about a month. I'm four or five years old, you know, and I'm watching some TV, and we're at a church, and sure enough, I get asked this question. My sister, who's older, is with me, but I get asked this question. What kind, you know, are, who are you? What kind of a Christian are you? And I get my words mixed up. 
And instead of saying, I'm a Pentecostal, I looked at this elder in the church and I said, I'm a prostitute. <laughs> yeah, that church never supported my parents as missionaries. I don't know why. <laughs> now, for me, I have no idea I've done anything wrong. Little kids, they don't know. My sister, who's years older than me, she's in shock. You don't say things like that. The elder can't hardly speak. His mouth just drops open. But Jesus says, listen, the little children, when you see yourself with such a purity and an innocence that you can just be who you are because you know the Father receives you. Here's a few more notes from kids that reflect how we should carry this attitude of little children. Take a look at the screens. I read the Bible. What does begat mean? Nobody will tell me. Are you really invisible? Or is that just a trick? Did you mean for the giraffe to look like that or was it an accident? I went to this wedding and they kissed right in church. Is that okay? I wish there wasn't so such thing of sin. I wish there was no such thing of war. Did you really mean do unto others as they do unto you? Because if you did, then I'm going to fix my brother. <laughs> Dear God, please put another holiday between Christmas and Easter. There is nothing good in there now. <laughs> Dear God, how come you did all those miracles in the old days and don't do any now? Dear God, I am doing the best I can. There is this amazing liberty when you trust God as a little child, and you know you can simply be yourself. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to show yourself. You can just be who you are. In this auditorium, we are all on these different stages of faith and journey. And when you're a little kid, you can just be yourself. A few years ago, I was going into a country where Christianity is illegal. And we were smuggling some stuff in, some Bibles and some religious contraband in. And we're at the border, and there's all these border guards, and they've got guns, and I get asked the question, you know, got any Bibles in there? And I said, no. I came back, and I was telling a lady about this, and she was kind of shocked. She said, wait a minute, you lied? Aren't you a pastor? And you lied? Isn't that wrong? And I said, yeah, maybe, but when there are men with guns, lying just comes really natural. <laughs> it just flows out of you. Get this, I was just being myself. I, maybe it was wrong, maybe it wasn't. But it's who I was at that moment. And as a little child, can you imagine the liberty you could feel today if you could just be yourself? This is where I'm at, my journey of faith. These are the things I do pretty well. These are the things I maybe don't do so well. But it doesn't matter. Because I have a father who accepts me yeah. as a little child, and I don't have to control it. Now, there's another one, the last one. He says, the kingdom belongs to these. Now, get this. He said, when you're a little child, when you trust me like a little child, you get to claim all this stuff. Have you noticed little kids, really little kids, they have no concept of ownership. Everything is theirs. Mine, mine, mine. I took my one-year-old to the Seal Beach Park. There's a little area where there's sand. Some kids had bought their toys, their sand toys. They were on the slide. I set my one-year-old down. He made a beeline for them. He just started playing with them. It never crossed his mind that they weren't his. They're just mine. They're there. Now, get this. Jesus says that's actually what it means to trust God. You are not just a servant in the house. You're a co-heir with Christ. And all of the kingdom is fully available for you as a child. Not to be greedy and materialistic. But there's this attitude you have that when I have this father and he adopts me into his family, everything that belongs to my father becomes part of who I am. I get to live like this when I trust him as a child. Last set of notes. Look at these notes from these kids that illustrate how we should live. Dear God, my brother is a rat. You should give him a tail. Ha ha. <laughs> Dear God, 
thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. <laughs> Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. It works with my brother. <laughs> Dear God, I think about you sometimes, even when I'm not praying. Dear God, I think the stapler is one of your greatest inventions. <laughs> Dear God, I didn't think orange went with purple until I saw the sunset you made on Tuesday. That was cool. Even the sunset belongs to you. Again, not so that you can be greedy, but that you can be just like Jesus and incredibly generous. Let me illustrate this way. When, when my kids were little, we felt like the Lord came to us and told us to give one of our cars away to a family that didn't have any cars. So we said, let's make this a family venture. So we called the kids in and we said, listen, Mom and I feel like God is speaking to us about giving our car away. What do you think? Should we do that? And all three of my little kids immediately said, absolutely. And I thought, well, that's easy for you to say. You don't have to replace the car. <laughs> yes, Dad, we should do this. And I'm going, yeah, well, pony up your, you know, your, your allowance. No, no, no. Absolutely, Dad. So we went and we gave the car to this family. My kids were there. And I watched the faces of my children. And they were beaming with joy. They had this unbelievable, healthy pride that they were a part of a family that had a father who wanted to give his stuff away to people who were in need. And in the back of my mind, at first I'm thinking, wow, it's easy for the kids to do this. They don't have to try to replace the car. But then I thought, no, Joel, that's actually a picture of what God wants for us. We're like the kids. And he comes along to us and he says, listen, there's this family over here and they don't have a car. I'm thinking about giving a car away. And we go, absolutely. Take this one. Because it's on you to replace it. Amen. All of the kingdom is available for you. All of the resources are available for you. When you become like a disciple that has control, you're going, uh, I don't know if I can give that car away. But when you become like a child, and it belongs to you because of a father, then you have this trust that says, yeah, it's on you, Heavenly Father. It's on you to replace it. It's on you to provide. You're the one who's going to do that. And Jesus says, there's this battle. And some of you this morning know this battle. There are areas of my life I'll trust your power with. But there are areas of my life... I will control. And if you're in that battle, you know the burden and the anxiety and the stress it creates. And you can't simply just shift over to trust intellectually or emotionally. But during communion, Jesus can do a miracle in your heart if you're willing to put yourself in the place of a child and say, help me trust you and all the kingdom will be available to me. You see, this picture of a child, it's not just for us. God gives this picture of a child so that we can understand his identity. He wants to be known as this incredible, loving father for you. When, when, when Lisa was just like two years old in, nurse, in preschool, we used to have to go pick her up. And picking up Lisa at preschool was the most wonderful thing that my wife and I wanted to do. And we would always argue with each other over who gets to pick up Lisa. Because when you picked up Lisa, there was this big room and you would come through the doorway and she'd be at the other end of the room and this adorable two-year-old Chinese girl would see you and she would run all the way across the room and she would jump into your arms. And it was such a great feeling that we used to fight over who gets to pick up Lisa. And one day, we both went together because we couldn't settle the fight. So we're walking through the doorway and we're like jostling for position with each other <laughs> for who gets to have Lisa jump in her arms. And my nasty wife, this evil woman, <laughs> Seriously, she steps in front of me and becomes like this barricade. So I'm behind. And I know I'm not going to get Lisa jumping into my arms because this evil woman has stepped in front of me. And then the most amazing thing happened. Here's Lisa, right? And she sees Marie and she sees me behind kind of jumping up, you know. And she starts to run for Marie. And I just move a little bit over to the side of Marie. And as she's running for Marie... She does this juke move like an NFL running back. And she fakes Marie out, goes around her, and jumps into my arms. 
And I said, yes, I am dad. I am the father. This is what Jesus wants you to do. He wants you to run and jump into the arms of an indescribable loving father. Trust. Starts with grace. First battle. I don't have to perform. It's not about religion. It is about a fear of God that makes grace amazing. And then shame is gone and I lift my head. And I never have to ever walk in that shame again because of grace. And as I walk out in grace, I don't control. But I trust like a little child. We're going to get ready to take communion. And if you came in and didn't get one of these elements, would you raise your hand? And the ushers will make sure you get one. Because I don't want anybody to miss this moment. There are many of us in here, and we understand this battle because we are experiencing this battle. You go, Joel, I get it. There are times when I'm thinking to myself, wow, I got to behave better. Yes, by all means, we obey the Lord because we love him, but when you slip into performance, you're losing that battle. And you need a miracle, some of you. Jesus, Show me your grace all over again. But I can lift my head with no more shame and no more guilt because of your amazing grace. And then there are others of you in here, and if you're really honest, you're going to go, Joel, you're right. Some other areas of my life, my money, my relationships perhaps, I'll control those. I'll rely on God for his power, but not for his wisdom or authority. Could I really be like a little child and trust him? And there's this battle that goes on. As we take communion, your prayer for God's miracle is going to be, Jesus, help me to trust you. Help me to fully depend on you and not be self-sufficient. Lead me to jump in your arms. Because this battle is not won by emotion or intellect. Is one when the Holy Spirit takes the truth of God's word in our heart and a miracle takes place because we ask a prayer and he answers the prayer. We take communion because Jesus taught us to do this. We remember what he did, his death and resurrection. But listen to me, it's more than just a symbolic memory of a past event. Because we remember what he did, we have a faith. He is here today and working in our lives today. There's something deeply spiritual about the act of communion. It was deeply spiritual in the New Testament. It's deeply spiritual now. Because as we recall, you died, you resurrected. The battle of grace is won. You're alive, and I can trust you. The battle of faith is won. And whatever area you are in this battle, I'm going to give you a minute to take communion just on your own, quietly, personally, intimately. And you just say a simple prayer while you take this communion. You know how it works. The top layer gets unwrapped, and the wafer is there, which represents the body of Christ. Then the second layer represents the blood of Christ. Just ask him a simple prayer. Show me your grace again so that I walk with no shame, no guilt. Would you lead me to trust you? So those areas I'm trying to control, I depend fully on you for. Right now, just for this next minute, take communion with Jesus and talk to him and believe and expect he will do a miracle right here, right now for you in your battle.
Jesus, we thank you today that you are our Savior. The battle of grace is ours. And you are our Lord. The battle of faith is ours. I pray for any person in this auditorium this morning who needs a miracle. Because there's still part of them that sees themselves with a shame or a guilt. They're trying to prove themselves. Jesus, right now, would you liberate them from that wrong thought? Would there be an indescribable freedom right now in your name that comes upon them where they discover a love and a grace that cannot be defined in human terms but is nonetheless incredibly real? Like the tax collector, may we lift our heads because you have made us new. And Lord, for anyone who is here and they are battling that battle of trust, we trust you with some areas, but not with all areas. May there be no judgment or condemnation. May there be no sense of religious obligation. Would you instill in us by the Spirit of God, an expectation, this incredible opportunity to jump into your loving arms, Father, to trust you completely, problem or no problem, with every area of our life. May that burden of anxiety and stress be removed from our shoulders because we have this heavenly Father gives us his kingdom and we can walk in it as children. Lead us to trust you. Would you do that miracle? We thank you, Jesus. 2,000 years ago, you came, you died, and you resurrected so that we could live in grace and faith. We're so grateful. It is like children that we receive that gift you have for us. It is like children that we receive you. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Could we give the Lord just a praise offering?